Today we will be doing Unit 1.1 of IGCSC Physics. These are the points required by the CIE syllabus for 2020 examinations. Let's begin. The first point is to know how to measure lengths with a rule. These must be memorized. First point is wire must be straight, wire must be laid alongside the rule, ends of the wire must be neatly cut, one end of the wire must be on zero and the other end must be read accurately. So that just means if you have a rule, um, the wire that you're measuring, it should be straight and laid alongside the rule. The ends of the wires must be neatly cut. It shouldn't be like that. Um, one end of the wire must be on zero exactly on zero and the other end you should um, read it accurately right next if you're measuring something very thin like a piece of paper or a sheet of paper you take 500 sheets of paper you find their length using ruler and divide it by 500 and then the answer will give you the length of one sheet of paper <coughs> If you, if you want to measure a curved line or the circ or circumference of a cylinder, you can, you can take a thread and mark it, uh, like lay it along the line, then mark where the line ends. You can measure that thread using a ruler. The thread should be laid exactly on, alongside the line and then just measure it using a ruler. Right. Uh, for the next point, measuring volumes. If it's a regularly shaped object, like a rectangular block, um, uh, like that. That's not rectangular, but okay, like a like a dice or a cube. You can use the formula, which this is s cubed, or a cylinder, which is pi r squared h. If it's regularly shaped, you use formula. If it's irregularly shaped, like a li like liquids, you use measuring cylinders. There are a few points you need to know about when using measuring cylinders. Those are, first of all, you have to look at the, uh, the scale horizontally. You have to read the level on the bottom of the meniscus and you use a cylinder that's three or four times larger than what you were measuring. So let's say this is a measuring cylinder. If you're measuring something that is one liter, you're going to use something that is that measures up to three liters, right? And then if, let's say this is the um, volume of the liquid, you are going to look at the bottom of the meniscus, which is the lowest, which I... Like, not even there. Like, at the bottom of this line. Yeah, there. And then you measure that. And look at the scale horizontally. Those are for measuring cylinders. Those are the points for measuring cylinders. Um, usually, if you look at a scale, it's not very accurate and let's say you're looking at the scale and this is one two uh, one one and a half uh, zero point five one one point five and two let's say it's over here that's not exactly at one that's like maybe zero point nine five so if you want a precise use of measurement you're going to use either vernier calipers or a micrometer screw gauge Vernier calipers are used like this. First, you have to close the calipers such that the jaws... Okay, so if this is the vernier calipers, this is the beam. I'll, yeah, use this. So, this is a sliding jaw. So, if this is the object, you close the calipers. So, these jaws should not be 
you're exerting too much of a pressure. They just should touch lightly on this object enough to hold it in place. Right? And then um, there are two scales. There's one main scale and a vernier scale. The main scale, it's the bigger one, and the vernier scale, it's the smaller one. Right? Um, there. Now, first you have to close the caliper such that the, such that the jaws um, touch on the object firmly but lightly. Firmly but lightly, as I said. Now, you look at the zero on the vernier scale. The zero on the vernier scale is this. This is the zero. Read the measurement right before the zero, which is that one, and that's going to be, in this case, 35. Write it down. 35 would be the main scale reading. The main scale reading. Okay, so first step is you look at the... First you close the calipers so that the jaws fix on the object, not too, not too hard, not too hard, like just lightly enough to hold it in place. Next, you um, look at the vernier scale and look at the zero on the vernier scale and read the measurement right before the zero, which is 35 in this case, and write it down as main scale reading. Then you look at the vernier scale. This is the vernier scale. Look at the vernier scale and check for one, like one place where the markings are aligned. So here, on the first one it isn't, the second one it isn't, third it isn't. On the seventh one, which is that one, it is aligned. So, um... So on the seventh one, it's aligned. So over here, you're going to write as seven is the fraction of a millimeter that it's aligned on. So seven, that's the fraction of a millimeter. That just means it is 0 0.7 millimeters. That's all. And what you're going to do at the end is you're going to add the main scale reading and the the 0 0.7 would be the vernier scale reading. Vernier scale reading is the fraction of a millimeter that you took from the vernier scale. The main scale reading is the one which you took right before the zero. So then you have to add the main scale reading and the vernier scale reading. So 35 plus 0 0.7 millimeters, that would be 35.7 millimeters. That's how you use a vernier caliper. Next, the micrometer screw gauge. The micrometer screw gauge, it has a rotating barrel and it has the jaws and it has the friction clutches. Now, this micrometer screw gauge, how do you measure an object? First, you keep turning this barrel until the jaws tighten, these jaws, until they tighten on the object. Not tighten, just like as in tighten enough to hold it in place. Then these, uh, the friction clutches would give the right amount, just the right amount of pressure. Then you're going to read the main scale. The main scale is the scale. Uh, yeah, this is the main scale. The main scale is this. The fractional scale is this one, fractional scale. So um, you rotate this part until this just tightens on it. You'll know that the, uh, the what's it called? The, fraction, the friction clutches would give the right amount of pressure. Then you look at this. This is the main scale. You measure the main scale and read it up to 0 0.5 millimeters, not 0 0.1, 0 0.5 millimeters. And then um, you look at the number which is on the, you look at the number which is on this rotating barrel. That number is 
you count it. the number which this line hits on. This line hits on a specific number, and you have to read that number. That number is um, 16, 17. It is 17, so that's a fraction of a millimeter. When you read the number over here, that would have been 0 0.51, 1 1.52, 2. 2.5. It would be 2.5 millimeters, and that is the main scale reading. You add it to 0 0.17, because 17 is a f is over here, which is the fraction of a millimeter, and it's a fractional scale reading, so 0 0.17 millimeters, and then you'll get your answer. <coughs> 2.67 millimeters using a micrometer screw gauge. Now... The last point is measuring time. To measure time, you can use many different tools or devices. So in a lab, you do something else. And when you're in a marathon, you do something else. And when you're using, when you're measuring the time, when you're, when you're measuring short intervals of time, you would do something else. Um, now. In a lab, you would use stop clocks and stop watches. That's because um, the point one, the point zero zero one, does not matter. But when you're studying motion, sometimes it does matter. So you use a light gate connected to an electric timer. This electric timer it switches on and it starts timing once the um, the runner starts running, and it stops when he fin at the finish line. Now, to measure short intervals of time, you take the time for one swing of a like the time for one swing of a pendulum is a period. So, if this is a pendulum, if it go okay, it starts its journey from here. It goes like this, and it comes back. That that is called a period, right? How are you going to measure one period? Um, it would be very inaccurate if you just measured one. So what you're going to do is that you're going to take a stopwatch and measure how long it takes for 50 periods to occur. Then you divide the answer by 50. That's the average per swing. That's the average time for one swing of a pendulum. Um, I think we've covered everything for... So you know, it's 1.1 is complete.